quiet, numbskulls. I'm broadcasting. All right, let's take it from the top again. Places. Action. Well, let's see. We have on the bags. We have who's on first, what's on second. I don't know who's on third. That's what I want to find I out. I say who's on first, what's on second. I don't know who's on third. Are you the manager? Yes. You're going to be the coach too? Yes. And you know the fellow's name? Oh, I should. Well, then who's on first? Yes. I mean the fellow's name. Who? The guy on first. Who? The first base. Who? The guy playing first. Who is on first? I'm asking you who's on first. That's the man's name. That's whose name? Yes. Well, go ahead and tell me. That's it. That's who? Yes. The golden age of radio was truly a remarkable time. Welcome to Classic Radio Rewind. From adventures to westerns, from comedy to sci-fi, Classic Radio Rewind is your ticket to the theater of the mind. Without any further ado, here's your host for Classic Radio Rewind, Barry Swinker. Thank you very much, Mr. Dex Rowe, and welcome to the very first edition of Classic Radio Rewind. This is Barry Slinker, and I am the owner of the WOTR Radio Network, the network of classic old-time radio stations, old-time radio USA, Suspense Radio USA, Crime Time Radio USA, and the newly established Radio Mystery Theater USA. Those stations can be heard 24 hours a day, 7 days a week over at the WOTRRadioNetwork.com website. But more on that later. This is the first inaugural episode of Classic Radio Rewind. I will be your host for the next two hours as we rewind the years and showcase the classic radio entertainment from the 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond. We'll showcase the different genres of old-time radio featuring mysteries, dramas, westerns, and comedies, and more. In this podcast, we will hear The Red Skelton Show from 1950, followed by an episode of Lights Out from 1942, and then we'll wrap things up with X-1 from 1955. But first up, it's an episode from The Shadow, with an episode titled The Shadow's Revenge. In this episode, two fugitive killers abduct Margot Lane to draw Lamont Cranston to their hideout. To their surprise, the shadow appears instead. So now coming up right now on Classic Radio Rewind is The Shadow from May 11, 1947, entitled The Shadow's Revenge. Company, producers of salt for every farm and home use, brings you the thrilling adventures of the shadow, the hard and relentless fight of one man against the forces of evil. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. Before today's exciting adventure begins, listen kids, here's a super duper offer. Your chance to get the thrilling magic shadow ring. Not just a piece of jewelry, but a ring that acts like it's enchanted. Wear it in a dark room and it changes to a glowing circle of light. You've never seen anything so weird and mysterious. I know you want your magic shadow ring right away. And later in the program, I'll tell you how to get it. And, Mom, I'm sure you'll be glad to help by saving the white star from a round package of Kerry's Table Salt. This extra refined salt sinks down deep into food and does wonders for the flavor. Yes, you'll be as glad to have Kerry's Salt as your youngster will be to get that fascinating magic shadow ring. Full details of the offer later. But now, the shadow. The Shadow, who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Years ago in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and mysterious secret, the hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama... The Shadow's Revenge. In a cell, in a 
large Midwestern penitentiary, two convicts sit on the edge of a lower bunk. One, a big, swarthy man, pretends to read a newspaper several days old. The other pretends to tie his shoe. Just got the tip off from the boys. Everything's set, Rocco. The wind aren't the end of the corridor, though, Pete. Yeah, all set. Okay, Regan, you know what to do. Make it good. Suppose we get separated. I told you where to come, D. Meet me there. Check. Here goes. God! God! Man, Chief! God! God! All right, now what's going on down here? Regan, God, he just keeled over. It started morning like this. Okay, stand back from the door. I'm coming in. Now, what's the matter, Regan? Where's it hurt? Right here. It hurts awful. Yeah, I don't think it won't hurt. No! Oh! What a wallet. You like to kill him, Rocco? Got the gab, grab his gun. I got his keys. Come on. Here's the window. Cover me, Regan. I'm going out. Right. Okay, Regan. Jump. I'll clear it down here. Come on, top. Yeah. Now what, Rocco? The car's waiting for us where Annie left us. We got to make it. Oh, duck! They've turned on the spotlight. They left us on the guard. We got to run for it. Rocco, looks deserted. What do you expect, Danny, to do? Regan, set up a flock of floodlights to welcome you? Well, I give you see you. Let me just raise the shade in that front row. Okay, that's the old player. Let's go. Yeah? Okay, Annie, open up. Me, Rocco. Inside, quick. I didn't think you'd make it, Rocco. You two are really hot. Come on, I got close to you in the car. And... No, I ask you, is that any way to greet a guy that's been sitting it out in stir for five years? Come here, Andy. Cut it out, Rocco. You ain't got time to doodle around. You got to get moving. I can meet you out of town someplace. You and... won't have to meet me any place, baby. I'm not going out of town. What? I got business here first. Business? Not that guy Cranston you're always talking That's about. That's right, Annie. I swore I'd pay him for that one-way ticket to the big house. You wouldn't want me to renege on a debt, would you? You'll never make it, Rocco. Every copper in the country's got your picture, and it ain't because you're pretty. No copper's gonna grab me, Annie. I had a long time to think about it. Five long years in a cheese box. All I could think of was catching up with Cranston five long years. I ain't passing up the chance now. <laughs> What's the big surprise you said you had? I'm not sure myself. Margot Shrevey called me a little while ago and was quite insistent I'd take a ride with him in his new cab. New cab? Yes, you see, his old one just about fell apart on him. Oh, no, tell me it isn't so. What is... Is that Shrevey perched up there on top of that handsome cab? Now I've seen everything. (laughs) Whoa, there, whoa. Hello, Mr. Cranston, Miss Lang. <laughs> Hello, Shrevey. Now, how do you like my new cab? How do you like, huh? Shrevey, what's the idea? Well, a new cab I couldn't get, Mr. Cranston, so I figured this is better than nothing. I figured this is better than... Uh, get in, I'll take you for a ride. Well, I... Oh, come on, Lamont, let Okay. <laughs> All right, then you go, down. Right. Uh, down the avenue, Mr. Cranston? You wouldn't know it. When you go slow, you wouldn't know it. Down the avenue will be fine. Shrevey, what, what's this? That's a portable radio, Mr. Cranston. Maybe my fair likes romantic music, maybe you like. Oh, this is really a surprise, Lamont. Let's have some music on the radio. All right, darling. And now we bring you a special warning from Police Commissioner Weston. Al Rocco and Ed Regan, the two convicts who escaped from Logmore Penitentiary, are still at large. Police are baffled by the fact that neither Rocco nor Regan have made any attempt to break through the blockade thrown around the metropolitan area. Both men may be holed up someplace in the center of the city and make... What's the idea of turning it off, darling? Mm, I'm taking no chances of you getting mixed up in that case. After all, we're out for a nice ride. Oh, 
Come on. What is it? Did you see that gorgeous hat in that window? Uh, how do we stop this thing? Oh, I might have known. Wait a minute, I'll wrap. Right. There's something wrong, Mr. Cranston. Something's wrong. You gotta stop, Shrevey. Miss Lane saw a hat she'd like to try on. Okay. Whoa, whoa there. Thanks, Shrevey. I won't be a minute, Lamont. Mm-hmm. I'm beginning to see why these things went out of style. A man couldn't go a block in one without his wife seeing a hat or a frock in a window. Yeah, you saved money on gas, all right. But I don't think the horse is going to replace the auto, Mr. Cranston. I don't think it's going to replace. Look, Rocco, this is crazy. You'll be picked up sure. We're headed right for the middle of town. I told you before, Annie. You do the drive and leave the rest to me. Annie's right, Rocco. Look at all the cops. Around. Relax, Regan. This is the last place they'd look for us right under their nose. You're not going to get anything out of this guy Cranston but grief. I know what I'm doing. You mind telling us, Rocco? Maybe like that we'll feel better. Okay. We're putting the snatch on Cranston. Hmm. Just like that. He walks up to you, gets into your car, and says... I'll go peaceful, Rocco, just like that. Yeah, just like that, Annie. So you get cranced, and that still don't get you past those roadblocks. You're still electric chair bait, Rocco. That's what you think. This guy Cranston pulls plenty of weight with the cops, huh? They all know he's a buddy of Commissioner Weston's, don't they? Oh, I begin to see what you mean. And when you get in the clear? When I get in the clear, Annie, I tattoo my initials on Cranston with a forty-five. <laughs> Something, Mr. Cranston, you was one? Shrevy, how long have we been waiting for Miss Lane? Seems like ages. Well, we've been sitting here in a hack for half an hour. We've been... What is it, Shrevy? Shrevy, what's the matter? Well, well, if it ain't my old friend Lamont Cranston, I've been looking forward to seeing you again, pal. El Rocco. Yeah, El Rocco, remember? I made a date with you that last time we met. I said I'd be coming out to get you. Here I am. Shrevey. At the moment, I'm engaged, Mr. Cranston. A character is standing no less than ten feet from me with his gun pointing right at my stomach with his gun pointing. Ed Regan, I presume. Still the smart cook here, yeah, Cranston. Where's the dame? Uh, Miss Lane? I know she'll just hate missing you, but she didn't come along today. She had Lane, little... gal, Rocco. She was in the hat store. No, Marco, don't. Shut up, Cranston. Sorry, Lamont, I didn't... What's all this? Rocco's the name, sister. Al Rocco. I was just inviting you and your friend Cranston to take a ride. You'll never get away with this, Rocco. Don't you realize this is right in the heart of the biggest city in the world? Yeah, pretty smooth, eh? All right, get out of this wagon and into the car. And no fuss. That is, unless you'd like to see your girlfriend splashed all over the sidewalk. All right, Rocco. Come on, come on, get in, Rocco. There's a cop back there and they got a corner. Okay, okay. Inside the car, you two. What about the monkey up in the back? What do we need him for? Not Shrevey. Rocco, don't. So long, circuit. Oh, get going, Regan. up to the roadblock, Rocco. What are we going to do? Nothing. Cranston's going to take us right through it, aren't you, Cranston? You'll never make it, Rocco. The police okay, will grab you. Okay, slow down. They're stopping the cars one by one. Go on. We're next. Remember, Cranston. All right, folks. You'll have to... Oh, hello, Mr. Cranston. You can go through. Hello, Cassidy. Look, Cassidy. We're holding up the line, Lamont. We'd better go along. Cassidy, look, these men... They're piling up behind you, Mr. Cranston. Mind moving along? Go on. You heard the officer... I tried. Sure, you tried. I told you what was going to happen if you crossed me. Not here, Rocco. There may be other load blocks. Can't you wait till we get to the hideout? Okay, okay. That gives you just about another hour to be healthy, copper. Come 
Molly all right? My head. What happened, Margo? It was Rocco. As soon as we were past the roadblock, he stopped the car and beat you over the head with his gun. How do you feel? Pretty rugged. Where are we? I don't know. Some kind of a hideout. They threw you into this back room. What's going to happen to us? Not what they think, Margo. They're going to pay for the vicious murder of Shrevey. How? What can we do? We can't do anything, Margo. The shadow can. Yeah, yeah. Listen, here they come. All right, Margo, get back. The shadow's going to handle these killers. I don't think we ought to stay out here any longer than we have to, Rocco. We're staying until they square things off with Cranston. <laughs> yeah, but... <laughs> what, what's his trouble? I don't know. <laughs> what are you laughing at, Cranston? I am the shadow. The guy's I've come to vengeance. The crack and the skull must have sent him off his rocket. I am the Shut shadow. Shut up, Cranston. Get back against the wall, eh? Cranston? <laughs> I am the shadow. Okay, so you're Napoleon. Now get back. You can't see the shadow. No man sees the shadow. Come on, what's wrong? They, they can see you. You've lost your power. That ain't all he's lost, ladies. Stand away from him. No, I won't let you do it. Don't make it too tough on yourself, sister. Come on, baby. Do like you told. Take your hands off her. Oh, you're you're I told you to stay out of my hair, sister. Now you're gone. No. No. Oh. oh. Margo. You killed Margo! We'll return to the shadow in just a minute. Now, calling all boys and girls. Get in on this exciting offer from the makers of Cary Salt. They have a wonderful surprise for you. Maybe you've heard about the mysterious magic shadow ring that glows in the dark with a weird ghost-like radiance. But believe me, kids, you can't imagine what it's like until you get one and see it happen. The light seems to appear from nowhere to form a steadily gleaming circle on your finger. You can send signals with it just by waving your hand. Yes, you'll have no end of fun with your magic shadow ring. Here's how to get it. Tell Mom you want the white star from a round package of Kerry salt either plain or iodized. Then mail the white star and five cents, just a nickel, to Carry Salt, Hutchison, Kansas. Or you can send a sales slip from any Carry Salt product along with five cents. Be sure to print your name and address plainly. Your magic shadow ring will come postpaid. Remember, send five cents in coin with either that Carry Salt white star or the sales slip from any Carry product to Carry's C-A-R-E-Y-S, Carry Salt, Hutchison, Kansas. Now, back to the shadow. Lamont Cranston and Margot Lane are being held by Al Rocco and Ed Regan, two escaped killers. When Lamont's power to change himself into the shadow fails, Margot attempts to keep Rocco from shooting Lamont. In the ensuing scuffle, Rocco shoots and kills Margot Lane. You killed her. You killed Margot. Rocco, I'll kill you with my bare hands. Put that out. Kill me. I'll kill you. I'll kill you. Put it out, Mr. Cranston. It's me, Shreve. Hey, wake up. Wake up, huh? Huh? You've been dreaming, you bet. And I got bruises to prove it. And it was all a dream? Shadow... You're not dead, Shrevey. Not that I heard. Am I supposed to be? Am I supposed to? Yes, it was all a horrible dream. It was so real. I dreamt about Rocco and Regan. You and Margot. Where is Margot? That's why I woke you, Mr. Cranston. What happened? Well, I don't know. I figured Miss Lane was taking pretty long, so I went in the hat store to see. And? Well, the lady says Miss Lane left 15 minutes ago. A man followed her into the store, said something to her, and she left with him. Lord, Shrevey, it's a dream coming true. They've got Margot. Who? Rocco and Regan, Shrevey. They swore they could even with me. They're trying to do it through Margot. That dream sure must have been real. It sure must have been. Yes, it was. Very real. Something about it didn't strike quite true. Now, what was it? Was it? I know. It wasn't something in the dream. It was something that should have been in that wasn't. It was a girl. Uh, what girl? 
Back when we broke up Rocco's gang, there was a girl who fronted for them. The police couldn't get enough evidence to convict her, but she was in it, all right. That would explain why the police can't find Rocco, too. Well, how? There must have been someone on the outside to help in that jailbreak, Shreve. We've got to find that girl, Shreve. She's the key to this whole thing. Well, if we don't know who she is or where she is, won't that be difficult, Mr. Cranston? Won't that be? Not too difficult, Shreve. I've got an underworld contact who could find a tear in the ocean. I'll get back to you later, Shreve. I'm going down to see Mr. Adolphus Claremont Poindexter. <laughs> finally decided to come, too. Where am I? Who are you? What do you want with me? My name is Rocco. Al Rocco. Oh. Well, you know of me, huh? Good. We got uh, mutual friends, Miss Lane. I'm going to use you to stage a reunion. What do you mean? Lamont Cranston and I have an old debt to settle. What's that got to do with me? I can't contact Cranston without having to worry about the police, but if you call him... I won't do it. It'd be a lot more satisfactory paying Cranston what I owe him personally, Miss Lane, but if I have to pay him through you, I guess I'll just have to do it. You're bluffing. The guard at the prison died this morning, Miss Lane. I've got nothing to lose. They can only hang me once. Well... What do you want me to do? Call Grant. You'll tell him to drive his car out to the Skyville Highway. Five miles past the blinker, there'll be a dark sedan waiting. But... The telephone, Miss Lane, I haven't much time. No, I won't. I... I... You're hurting my wrist. The telephone. All right. All right, I'll call. Miss Lane is not with you? No, Mr. Poindexter. Did you get the information I wanted? Oh, very disappointing, Mr. Cranston. Very disappointing. You couldn't find the girl? She dropped out of sight five years ago, Mr. Cranston. Lived a very good life. Not a thing on her. But you did find her. Uh, uh, may I know uh, what you want with her, Mr. Cranston? Hate to bother a girl who's gone straight, you know. I expect her to lead me to Al Rocco and Ed Regan. R Rocco? Regan? <laughs> well, good day, Mr. Cranston. My regards to the charming Miss Lane. Mr. Poindexter, you don't understand. Miss Lane has disappeared. Don't you see? I think Regan and Rocco have her in an attempt to get at me. But, 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 but Rocco's a killer. <laughs> uh, besides, uh, what makes you think this girl can lead you to him? Call it a hunch. I just dreamed it up, but I know I'm on the right track. But, Rocco, uh, you sure you wouldn't like to know about somebody else? Gunner Boyne, for instance? Where's the girl, Mr. Poindexter? I've got to find her. <clears throat> her name's uh, Annie Delator now. Sweet girl. Very sweet girl. Where can I find her, Mr. Uh, Poindexter? Annie? Annie has an apartment on University Place. Third house from the corner. Top floor. A dozen exits. Over the roof and away like that. I think Rocco and Regan may be holed out there. Oh, hadn't thought of it. Oh, no, 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 no. Can't be. Too small. Besides, Annie must have a place out of town. Spend weekends someplace, never in town. Thanks, Mr. Poindexter. I'll see that the bartender arranges for your gratuity. Splendid, Mr. Cranston. Splendid. Uh, by the way, if you do happen to see Al Rocco, oh, be sure not to give him my regards. <laughs> Top floor, Shrevey. This must be your apartment right here. You want I should make like a messenger boy? Yes, that might do it, Shrevey. I got a message for Miss Delatour. Okay, Tony, I'm coming. Oh, I've been expect. What is this? Merely a social call, Miss Delatour. We're coming in. That's what you think, mister. I'll Of course, see... if you think Al Rocco might object. What? Okay, come in. That's what we figured on doing. Now, uh... What's this about Al Rocco? Don't tell me you don't know Rocco. After all he used to do to you. Okay, so you recognize me. But that was five years ago, and I've gone straight. You cop I'm never... not a policeman, Annie. What? What are you doing, then? Auditioning a quiz show? Who are you, anyhow? What a disposition. My name's Lamont Cranston. Lamont... Heard of me, perhaps? 
No. I gave up reading the funny papers when I found out Orphan Annie was really a midget. What a cord. Look, I don't know how you found me after all these years, but it won't do you any good. I don't know anything. There had to be someone on the outside to fix up a hideout for Rocco. That was you, Annie. You want I should give her the third degree, Mr. Cranston? You want I should give her? You stick that homely pan of yours any closer, and I'll carve my life's history on a dream, boy. You scare me about as much... Hold it, Shrevey. Don't let her get to that phone. No, let, let me go. Keep it quiet, Shrevey. This may be the break we need. Okay. Quiet now. This is Regan, Annie. Annie? Mm-hmm. Listen, I only got a minute. Al's getting itchy. He wants me to pick you up at the corner of 8th and Convent in half an hour. Will you be there? Mm-hmm. Let me go, you big gorilla. Let me go. I can't hold him anymore, Mr. Cranston. Give me that phone. You're Get... too late, Annie. Regan just hung up. Regan. Why, you... I'd like to stay here and keep your company, Annie, but I've got a date. Are you listening? Sorry, to me? Annie, but you won't get lonesome. I'll leave Shrevey here with you. And I'll give your love to Rocco when I see it. Rocco's going to be sore when he finds out I didn't pick up Annie. I waited for it as long as I could. If I give Rocco that signal, he'll blast me before I reach the cabin. That you, Regan? Yeah, Rocco. It's me. Where's Annie? I don't know, Rocco. I told her to meet me like you said, but she didn't show up. I waited for an hour. Something must have gone wrong. You mean you think the cops got her? Hey, we better get out of here. Not until I do what I came here to do. Well, can't you forget that guy, Cranston? You'll never get away if we keep hanging around here. Come inside. <laughs> well, Miss Lane, ready to tell us where we can reach Cranston? I tell you, I don't know. I, I tried to reach him in his apartment, and he hasn't come in yet. I haven't got time to fool you anymore. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Shadow, thank heaven you're here. Shadow. Yes, Rocco. This is the Shadow. Now we do meet under different circumstances. <laughs> Where are you? Where are you? Right here at your elbow, Rocco. See? Quickly, Regan. He's alongside of me. Get him. Oh, but now I'm over here, Rocco. <laughs> hey, I, I heard all about that guy. He's not a yeoman. I'm getting out. Regan! Come back! Regan! <laughs> he won't get far, Rocco. I took the trouble of letting the air out of all your tires. You devil. What do you want with me? I want nothing, Rocco. The state wants your life. Listen, Shadow, the minute I hear anything that sounds like cops coming, the girl gets it first. You... Don't move, Miss Lane. I can't see the Shadow, but I can see you. Well, Shadow, looks like a stalemate. Is it, Rocco? As soon as I let the air out of your tires, I took the precaution of removing the bullets from your gun. The... What? Thank you. Get... <laughs> Sorry to deceive you, Rocco, but I did have to distract your attention long enough to take your gun away from you. I'm not like Shadow, I'm not... No? That's what you think, Rocco. Hear those sirens? That's the police on their way here to make sure you keep that date at the death house. Margo, what's been bothering you? You haven't said a word for the last five minutes. That girl, Lamont. That Annie. Hmm? You must have known her pretty well five years ago to know where she lives. What? <laughs> Darling, I tell you, I never saw that girl before in my hmm. life. Then how is it that you dream about it? I didn't, Margo. That's just the point. She wasn't in the dream. And, and that... you missed her. I see. And all along... Now, look, darling. No, you needn't explain to me, Lamar Cranston. Margo, that kind of a girl wouldn't go for me. Wouldn't go for you, Mr. Cranston. Oh, you don't know the half of it. Oh, murder. So she did go for him, Shrevey? If she could have got loose, she would have gone for him. With a butcher knife, she would have gone for him. Oh. There, you see? Margo, I give you my word. If Shrevey keeps this hack, there are two things I'm going to do. (laughs) What? First, I'm going to swear off sleeping. And second... I'm going to nail up that trap door of his. (laughs) 
My friends, don't delay any longer. Send today for that amazing new carry saw booklet called Minerals and Your Livestock. It's now helping hundreds of dairy farmers, livestock feeders, and ranchers get bigger profits. This great book is free for the asking. Tells the shocking truth about mineral deficiency. Tells how even feeds that look good can rob you of profit. More important, it tells how to fight mineral deficiency. Give facts and figures, packed with interesting pictures. And it's authoritative, based on the work of hundreds of scientists and practical stockmen. Now here's how to get your free copy. Just ask the carry dealer in your town or send a postcard to Carry Salt, Hutchison, Kansas. That's all there is to it. Nothing to buy. But you'd better act right away. Tomorrow, sure, ask your carry salt dealer for a free copy of Minerals and Your Livestock. Or send a postcard to Carrie's, C-A-R-E-Y-S, Carry Salt, Hutchison, Kansas. Do it today. You'll find that Minerals and Your Livestock is a remarkable help in fighting mineral deficiency. Use it together with old reliable Carrie's Mineral Supplement Salt regularly. There's a variety of carry salt for every farm and home need. This story is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Again next week, the shadow will demonstrate that... The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> Next week, same time, same station, the Carry Salt Company brings you another strange and thrilling adventure in the shadows' daring battle against the forces of evil. Don't miss it. Meanwhile, be sure to send that Carry Salt White Star or a Carry Sales Slip along with five cents for the magic shadow ring. Dick Willard speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. That was The Shadow for May 11th, 1947 with The Shadow's Revenge. Coming up on Classic Radio Rewind is The Red Skelton Show. This series, running from 1939 to 1953, featured many of the characters and roles played by Skelton, keeping audiences laughing for many years. So here's one of those episodes right now, originally aired October 29th, 1950. Here is The Red Skelton Show titled The Hunting Trip on Classic Radio Rewind. You'd think Bergen had his own network. <laughs> <laughs> Less work and more play. Get a box of Tide today. The I D E From Hollywood, Procter & Gamble's Tide, the wash day miracle that gives you a better washing job than any soap on earth, proudly presents the Red Skelton Show. <laughs> With Red Skelton, David Rose and his orchestra, Lorene Tuttle, Pat McGee and Dick Ryan and John Holbrook will be me, Rod O'Connor. From the Skelton Scrapbook of Satire, a story entitled, Things That Happened on Our Hunting Trip. It stars Red Skelton. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Boy, what a day to go hunting. Yeah. This is real Indian summer. Yeah, Indian summer. That means it's warm if you're an Indian. <laughs> Well, it is warm. What do you mean it's warm? Last night it was so cold up at my place, one twin bed got in with the other. <laughs> well, you know, the outdoors will do us good. Oh, yeah. Get us in shape. What do you mean, get us in shape? Speak for yourself, fat boy. I'm in shape. This morning I got out of bed, walked downstairs with an armful of laundry, opened the door, picked up three bottles of milk, the newspapers, and didn't drop a thing. Well, what's so wonderful about that? No strings in my pajamas. <laughs> 
Hey, hey. Good. Looks like you're out of gas. Oh? That little hand is pointing to empty. Oh, well, that don't mean a thing. There's a gallon left, you see. You don't worry until it starts tapping on the glass then. <laughs> well, we're coming to a filling station. We'd better get some gas. Hey, look, there's a lunch room right next to the filling station, and get a load of that sign, will you? <laughs> get gas while you eat here. <laughs> Hey, let's go in. Come on, come on. Well, howdy, dude. Why, Daisy June. Daisy June. You want to buy something, or are you fellows members of the WWI? WWI? What's that? Wind, water, and information. <laughs> well, we're about out of gas. Put in one gallon. One gallon? We're trying to wean it. Hey, Red, let's go inside and get something to eat. No, thanks. One look at that place, and I'm not hungry anymore. Well, I am. I'll be right back. Hey, Clem. Well, here I am. <laughs> Boy, if that singing don't take away your appetite, nothing will. Bro. What you gonna have before you buy carbonate? <laughs> Can I see a menu? Oh, well, yeah, well, here it is. Here you are. This is a paper plate. Yep, I was up all night erasing it, too. <laughs> You see, it's still got some stains on it there. You just pick out whatever you think you'd like, and I'll try to guess what it is. Uh, is that pie fresh? Hmm? <laughs> I said, is that pie fresh? Well, it didn't say anything to me. <laughs> hey, you know, a feller came in here a while ago, and he says, Hey, what kind of pie is this, anyhow? Real nasty, like he said. What kind of pie is this, anyhow? <laughs> And I said, what does it taste like? He said, what is it, apple or peach? I says, well, I repeat, what does it taste like? <laughs> and he says, well, it tastes like glue. I said, well, and that's apple. <laughs> the peach tastes like putty. <laughs> I that better than what's here, I'll tell you. Is the pie fresh? What's that? I said, is the pie fresh? Well, I don't know. It didn't say anything to me. <laughs> Hey, look, what kind of ice cream do you have? What kind of ice cream have we mm -hmm. got? Cold. <laughs> Clem, yeah. you're a grade-A moron. And I'm homogenized, too. <laughs> oh, hi, DJ, one of our old friends. Mr. O'Connor, Mr. Skelton said to tell you that he's in the phone booth talking to his wife. It's the only place to talk to your well, wife. Well, thanks, Daisy June. I'll be right out. Oh. Mr. O'Connor, are you married? Well, yes, I am. Oh, shucks. Why is it all the handsome men are married? <laughs> oh, Daisy June, stop rubbing, rubbing your head across that hot stove like that. <laughs> Goodness, get back to your grease rash, will you? <laughs> oh, Clay, I'm so jealous of I you. am not jealous. <laughs> well, I see a little green-eyed monster. Well, that's what you get for looking in the mirror. <laughs> Too fast for us. He didn't get it. <laughs> Mr. O'Connor, I don't know why I put off with Clay. Oh, I'm stop flirting. I could do so much better. Oh? After all, don't I have a pretty face and a nice figure? The last time I saw a figure like yours, it was hanging on a hook in a smokehouse. <laughs> Yes, Daisy June, I think you have a nice figure. Now, see? Well, I can see, but evidently he can. <laughs> well, I've never been so insulted. Now, don't you two fight. Kiss and make up. Oh. Well, all right, Clem. I'm all puckered up. Yeah, well, you better lay off of that alum. <laughs> <laughs> say, you know, puckered up like that reminds me I ain't fed the hogs today. <laughs> now, Clem, don't you love... Yeah, I love that jute box. Hey, would you like to hear uh, that Dave Rose and his orchestra play Wally Wessler's uh, Ever Loving Rag? I'll put a nickel in. <laughs>
You know, lots of women argue in favor of the new no-rinse method of washing clothes. I certainly am. No rinsing with Tide works wonders on wash day. But lots of others stand by the rinsing method. I'll stick to washing with Tide and rinsing, just like I always have. Well, with Tide, you can use the method that suits you best. Whether you wash with rinsing or without, Tide does a better washing job than any soap on earth. Whichever way you wash, Tide will get your clothes miracle clean. Tide certainly gets white things perfectly dazzling and gets colored washables looking so bright. There's just nothing like the clean, outdoorsy smell of Tide-washed clothes. They dry so soft and fluffy, and ironing them is a downright pleasure. Yes, rinse or not, Tide does wonderful things to the family wash. You see, Tide does more than get the dirt out of clothes. It keeps that dirt in suspension right in the wash water. When you wring out the water, the dirt just has to go, too. So your clothes come from the wringer clean and bright, and with no dulling soap film on them, not a bit. For you see, unlike soap, Tide never leaves soap film to stick to clothes. So try Tide. Remember, Tide does a better washing job than any soap on earth. With rinsing or without rinsing. Tide's in. Dirt's out. T-I-D-E. Tide. T-I-D-E. Tide. <laughs> Boy, you sure picked a nice spot to go hunting. Nothing here, nothing. Do you see anything red? No, everything's green around here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's sit down and rest, will you? I'm awful tired. Well, I've never seen anyone in such bum condition. Say that again. I said I've never seen anyone in such bum condition. Now, say it again and a little louder. The guy from my draft board's listening. <laughs> <laughs> say, should we move further into the woods? Hey, wait a minute. I got something in my boot here. I'm going to have to take it off and empty it. I can't go any further, boy. Oh, boy. Hurry up. Empty your boots so we can move on. Okay, okay. I wondered what happened to that last hill we climbed. (laughs) Hey, where's my gun? Where's my gun? Why? There's a deer. Where? Over there. Those are cows. Oh, well, that's what I was going to say. Look at those dear little cows. <laughs> There's two one over there, over there. A white one for cream and a brown one for coffee. <laughs> hey, hold it, hold it. Look at all the wild turkeys. Wild turkeys, huh? Yeah. What do you think this is? Wild turkey, huh? <laughs> Wait, I hope I don't miss them. Where's my sawed-off shotgun? Well, I'll be. What's the matter? I sawed off the wrong end. <laughs> Hey, Skelton, what do you say we split up? Okay. There must be some game around here. Yeah. They must have gone on their vacation the same time we went on ours. <laughs> What's that? Oh, boy, a deer. Well, I'll get that baby. Hey, what's the big idea, buddy? <laughs> the idea, that bullet might have hit me in the head, Rick or stayed off and killed somebody. <laughs> well, he lumped him. Yeah. I'm sorry, I thought you were a deer. Look, old boy, there's a law against shooting any deer while he stooped over tying his shoe. <laughs> Are you having any luck? Huh? Are you having any luck? Yeah, so far I got an elk, a moose, and one mason who was back in his due. <laughs> hey, well, let's move out of this swamp. These yeah. mosquitoes are eating me up. Yeah, ain't they awful? They're like overfed hummingbirds. Oh, no, they're not that big. Oh, no. One of them just came up to me, and he tapped me with his beak, and he says, Pardon me, buddy. What type blood do you have? (laughs) I says, I have type A blood. He ripped out a siphoning hose, and he says, Well, you're not my type, but uh, could I take some home to a sick friend? (laughs) I hear one now. I hear one now. There he is. Where is he? Oh, he's on your forehead. Well, slap him. Okay. What happened? He slapped by. <laughs> hey, hold still. He might come back again. There he goes. Uh-oh. <laughs> hey, that mosquito didn't care much for your type blood. Well, why? He just bit that hound dog to get the taste of you out of his mouth. <laughs> hey, would you care for a little something to warm, warm you up? I got some evaporated dynamite here. <laughs> Two drinks of this, boy, you go bear hunting with a buggy whip. <laughs> you better lay off that stuff. Yeah, I think so, too. Every time I sneeze, I burn a hole in my hands. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what's that in the bushes over there? 
Well, what do you know? Somebody has drove out here and left their little cat to starve. I'm going to get that poor little lost thing. Look, that's not a cat, it's a skunk. Oh, no, it ain't. <laughs> Look, you aren't going to catch that thing, are you? Look, buddy, does Atchison tell MacArthur his plan? <laughs> If you must know, I plan on catching him. I am a very kind man. A very kind man. <laughs> I'm not going to let that poor little cat out here to start because I am a very kind man. Look, Willie, it isn't a cat. Yeah. Don't you smell something? No, I got an awful cold this day. Oh, come now. No one ever had a cold that bad. <laughs> Look, Superman... <laughs> I'm telling you to let that skunk alone All right, so he skunk and I got him Well, him. hold him by his tail Yeah, ain't he a beauty? Don't point him at me uh, You notice how nature has his fur, the color, so it'll camouflage him, huh? Yeah, but you know he's there <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm a cat fancier of course, I'm no fancier than this cat okay. <laughs> You know, I've always... I think my coal is loosening up. <laughs> Something's burning around here. <laughs> Say, you know, my wife loves cats. She always should... Hey, we ought to get up a petition and run that glue factory out of the state, you know. <laughs> Oh, Willie, put that thing down. Well, I will not look how friendly he is. He just lays there in my arms like he was dead. <laughs> I'm just thinking, maybe he is. <laughs> I'll take him over to our tent and surprise my wife with him. <laughs> uh, Willie. You know, I think somebody's making tires around here. <laughs> Willie. Better not take that in where your wife is. What do you mean? She loves cats. She loves cats. Oh, wifey, dear. <laughs> well, there's one for you. A door on a tent, honey. I'll... <laughs> well, that's what happens when you don't rehearse them, you know. <laughs> Hey, wifey, dear, look what I got for you. Well? She didn't like him either. <laughs> I wonder what she meant when she said birds of a feather flock together. <laughs> Hey, Skelton, it's getting a little late. Yeah. What do you say we make camp here and put away a few groceries? Okay, let's see what we've got to eat. Now, first, I'll get this stuff off my back here. Mm. Mm -hmm. There's my sleeping bag, my shotgun, hunting knife, compass, shovel, shower cap, an electric toaster. <laughs> electric toaster? Yeah. There isn't any electricity up here. I know that. I brought along a 20-foot extension cord. <laughs> There's a new word you can run and look up right now. <laughs> hey, stop squawking and make a fire while I go lay out these provisions I brought along here. Let's see, ketchup, A1 sauce, horseradish. Where's the food? Well, there's a nice jar of mustard. <laughs> what I figured we would shoot whatever we wanted. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I hope hot dogs are in season. <laughs> Hey, how about a can of spaghetti and meatballs? Oh, great. I like spaghetti and meatballs. Well, I hope you like tin, too. I forgot to bring the can opener. <laughs> hey, look, I'll build a fire. Uh, I'll Where chop was... down a tree. You? You chop down a tree? Don't make me laugh. <laughs> huh? I said, you can't chop down a tree. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make you laugh, huh? Oh. Well, it'd be nice to hear somebody around here. <laughs> I'll have you to know that I used to be a lumber... Wait a minute, here's a misprint. It's in capital letters. <laughs> it says lumber, jerk. I can read. <laughs> hey, look, Skelton, just gather some wood. Chopping <laughs> trees is a man's job. Well, here's one looks just about right. Now, stand back. I don't want this thing to fall on you. <laughs> Timber! Timber! <laughs> 
hardly worth the effort, was it? <laughs> well, that's okay. If we find something to eat, we've got a toothpick. Yeah. <laughs> hey, there's not... <laughs> there's not much dry wood around here, is there? I wish that my house in Bel Air was here right now. Well, we don't need that much wood. I know, but that's where I left the matches. <laughs> well, never mind. I just found my cigarette lighter. Oh, you mean the old Zippo? This is the one... <laughs> this is the one you gave me for my birthday, remember? Oh, how can I forget it? I'm still making payments on it. I wonder why you had it engraved the way you did To uh, rod from Red Skelton in the Bank of America <laughs> Got one more installment you can take their name off Doesn't this fire feel good? Yeah, but you know, I get a kick out of this Setting around a campfire You know, our country was built around a campfire The folks who settled all over America Just think at the end of the day Would make their little fire and then set around And make their plans for the future Gosh, those guys were proud to tell you who they were and what they believed. I wonder what they would say about an organization whose members don't have the courage to admit that they belong to the party. Yeah, maybe we need more campfires. Yeah, right now I need something to take my mind off the fact that I'm hungry. Well, you said a while ago if you wanted anything, you could go out in the woods and shoot it. Yeah, give me that rifle. I think I'll go shoot me a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you brought your guitar along. Sing yeah. a song. That'll take your mind off of being hungry. All right, what would you like to hear? Nothing. Huh? <laughs> but as long as you've got to sing, why don't you sing that one about the cowboy lost his girl on top of old Smokey? Oh, okay. Okay. On top of old Smokey, all covered with snow, I lost my true lover. From a courtin' to slow On top of old Smokey I went there to weep A false-hearted lover Is worse than a thief you and kiss you and tell you more lies than the cross ties on a railroad or the stars in the sky on top of old smoky all covered with snow I lost my true lover from a courting to slow You know, if you like the new no-rinse method of washing clothes, Tide can't be beat. Or, if you prefer to rinse, again, Tide is perfect. Yes, whether you wash with rinsing or without, Tide does a better washing job than any soap on earth. With either method, Tide gives you clothes that are dazzling white, sparkling bright. Tide leaves clothes so they dry soft and fluffy, iron smoothly. And with Tide, your clothes are clean, miracle clean. You see, Tide really gets the dirt out of clothes. Then, Tide keeps that dirt suspended in the wash water, so your wringer takes out the water and the dirt at the same time. Another thing, unlike soap, Tide leaves no sticky, dulling soap film on your clothes, so they look bright and fresh the way they should. Yes, whether you wash with rinsing or without, Tide does a better washing job than any soap on earth. So get Tide tomorrow. For more convenience, more economy, fewer shopping trips, get the new giant economy size package of Tide. Hey, 
Here comes three guys on horseback. Yeah, you better hide in those bushes until I find out what they want. They may be camp robbers. Whoa! Whoa! Oh, come on, horse boy! <laughs> you know, did I? I think that horse is deep. Why? Uh, you could shoot a gun beside his ear and you'd never hear it. Oh, I wouldn't say that. I'll prove it to you. I said beside his ear, not in it. <laughs> oh, that horse is all right. Look at that, he got up. <laughs> That horse is sort of like a politician when the people ask about the taxes. In one ear and right out the other. Uh, Say, aren't you Deadeye? That's what it says under my picture at the post office, stranger. Uh, Who might you be? And you say Sidney Green Street, and I'm going to hit you. (laughs) I'm Rod O'Connor from Hollywood. Oh, well, that's a dirty shame. (laughs) But we all got to go sooner or later. (laughs) Hey, it looks like we rode over here for nothing, boys. You see, this is roundup time, and we thought you was a stray herd. (laughs) It ain't there, and I'm sorry I said it. (laughs) Hey, boys, I'd like you to meet a friend of mine from Hollywood. Dude, these are two of my Western buddies. This is Sidewinder Sam. Uh, Howdy. And Tumbleweeds Hercules. Howdy. (laughs) <laughs> I don't like to say anything, but that one guy doesn't look like a real cowboy. Who, Tumbleweed there? He sure is. How come he isn't wearing any spurs? Long toenail. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that that uh, sidewinder Sam only has a thumb on one hand. Yeah, that happened in a bank down in El Paso. We was making out the withdrawal st- slip. And the dynamite that he was holding accidentally went off. <laughs> hey, you know, Dead Eye, this is sure a nice little camp this critter Ain't it has. Though? Seems a shame to let one man soak up all that campfire. Oh, uh, yes, partner. Why don't we just bunk here tonight? Well, you're certainly welcome to anything I have. Well, let's not make it so easy, huh? <laughs> Say, uh, how about a friendly little game of uh, cow hand canasta? What's that? That's poker with six shooters wild. (laughs) Pull up a log and sit down here. Well, I'm not very lucky at cards. Oh, you cheat too, huh? (laughs) I'll shuffle the cards, partner. You always shuffle the cards while they're still in the box? Yep. That's to prove that I ain't cheating. Because uh, Tumbleweed Hercules here is one of the roughest, toughest saddle bums in these parts. Ain't that right, Tumbleweed? I'm tough, all right. <laughs> As a matter of fact, the last time I looked in the mirror, I fainted from sheer fright. <laughs> We're going to miss you around here. Now, <laughs> oh, now, has everybody got their cards? Yep. Okay, I'm calling you. What do you got? I've got five of a kind, all jokers. That's funny. (laughs) I've got five red trays. I've got that beat, five aces. Well, it looks like I win. I got a pair of sixes. (laughs) Wish they got pearl handles on them. (laughs) Oh, no, you don't. I win. Now keep your hand off of that pot, tumbleweed. tumbleweed. (laughs) I got seven aces, and they're all red. That's a natural canasta. <laughs> oh, no, you don't, deadbeat. Dead eye. Uh, dead eye. <laughs> I'm just sick and tired of your cheating. Yeah. This gun I'm pointing at you says that you're a low-down, yellow-livered, no-backbone cheater. You peaked. <laughs> <laughs> Is that all you had was just one line, boy? <laughs> I don't shoot me there in cold blood, tumbleweed. Let's settle this. Uh, let's settle this. <laughs> Fire and square. I must have got in the wrong teeth today. <laughs> we'll be fair and square about this. That's Russian for don't turn your back, comrade. <laughs> I'll tell you what. We'll stand back to back. We'll take three steps and turn and fire. I'll count. That's fine with me. <laughs> must be a new man around here. <laughs> okay. You ready? Yes, One, I'm counting. Two. Oh. Oh, he got me. <laughs> He got me. Let's all turn a page and see where he got me. <laughs> I never thought I'd go this way. 
Well, so long, partners. I'm leaving. I'm going to the happy hunting grounds. Poor old dead eyes gone. Remove your hats, fellows. <laughs> Things won't be the same without dead eye around. They'll be better. <laughs> Whoa! Okay, boys. Deal out the cards. Dead eye, I thought you went to the happy hunting grounds. I tried, but they wouldn't issue me a hunting license. <laughs> Now, ladies and gentlemen, until next Sunday... This is Brett Skelton saying goodbye now, and thanks for listening. And this is Rod O'Connor reminding you that whether you wash with rinsing or without, Tide does a better wash day job than any soap on earth. Tide's in, dirt's out, T-I-D-E, Tide. This is a copyrighted feature. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. That was The Hunting Trip from The Red Skelton Show, originally aired October 29, 1950. There's more great old-time radio coming up as Classic Radio Rewind continues right after this. Welcome back to Classic Radio Rewind. I'm Barry Slinker, and coming up next, an episode from Lights Out. This series primarily focused on horror and the supernatural and was originally created by Willis Cooper and later taken over by Arch Obler. The series aired on various networks from January 3rd, 1934 to the summer of 1947, eventually transitioning to television. This episode, entitled Revolt of the Worms, tells the story of a scientist's obsession with inventing a formula for growing perfect roses and the horror that his experiments unleash. This is one to listen in the dark. From October 13th, 1942, this is Lights Out with Revolt of the Worms. Arch Obler bringing you another in our series of stories of the unusual. And once again, we caution you, these Lights Out stories are definitely not for the timid soul. So we tell you calmly and very sincerely, if you frighten easily, turn off your radio now. And now, if you haven't already done so, turn off your lights now and listen to Revolt of the Worms. I can do is sit and think and wait. Wait for the floors to lift and the walls to crash. Facts. Think of facts. Yes, a journal of facts. Think how it began, why it's happening. Journal of facts until the walls crash in and the thick flesh. Charles Prentice. There's a fact. Chemist and fool. Fool. Run away, run away, run away, run away. Run away from reality. War, 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 war. Run away. You mean we're going to live in this godforsaken place, Charles? Yes, Claire, I remember. You did say that. And I said... Of course we're going to live here. It's ideal for my work. But we're so far away from everything, Charles. So far away from what? Your friends, my friends? All right, Charles. Whatever you say, Charles. You never disagreed with me, did you, Claire? Why, it's so quiet up here, it's almost as if we are out of this world. Yes, I remember. Young Jackson, you did say that. I like working with you, sir. Why, up here, it's almost as if we were out of this world. Out of the world. I wanted to be out of the world. Hide. Until it's over. Yes, why not? Why not? What are you going all the way up there for, Prentice? To do my work, of course. But who cares about propagating new varieties of roses at a time like this? The times have nothing to do with it. I'll do what I please. I'll do what I please. 
But, Prentice, to leave suddenly like this, it doesn't make sense. Roses are fine in normal times, but a chemist of your ability? In times like these, certainly there's more productive work that you could do. I'm not interested in your opinions. I'll do what I please. You hear me? Do what I please. Do what I please. Yes, sir. Everything's ready, sir. Greenhouse. All ready for you, sir. One week ago, Wednesday. Does the wind always blow up here, Charles? Eh? I said the wind. Does it always blow like that? Why? Frightening. Mighty less frightening than the things that are happening back in the city? I suppose so. I know so. Where's that boy? Jackson. Yes, sir? The phosphates. Are they ready yet? Uh, not quite, sir. Well, get them ready. Every one of the plants. We work late tonight. Very late. Work late and hard. That was the answer to everything. Chemist of your ability. In times like these, there certainly must be more important work than propagating roses that you could do. A chemist of your ability. In times like these, there certainly must be more no, important... No, no, I wouldn't think of that, I told myself. Wouldn't think of that. Roses. Yes, develop the greatest rose in the world. That would be my answer to them. While they bombed and burned, I'd develop the largest rose the world had ever known. And when the world settled down again, I'd come back and bring the rose to them, and they wouldn't care if I had run away. My plan. Why did it go wrong? Claire, why did it go wrong? Claire... Oh. Dead. You're dead. They killed you. Dead as I'll be dead. If I could only think, why did it go wrong? Well, I put the solution that's left over, Mr. Prentice. Yes. I do remember. That was it. Oh, gosh, Mr. Prentice, I'm trying to understand, but... I'm so tired. You must keep working. The only salvation is to work. What's salvation got to do with roses? Don't be impertinent. Do your work. Yes, sir. Two cc for each plant, and careful. Don't let any of it touch the stem. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You weren't very happy, were you, Jackson? Those were things you couldn't understand. It, it isn't that I, I don't want to work, Mr. Prentice. It, it's just that I'm all mixed up. Uh, these roses. Why do I have to pour this stuff on them every hour on the hour? It doesn't make sense. Hormones, sure, I know what they are. Secretions from the glands in the human body. Sure, I know what they're for. Make us grow and everything. I get it. That, that's what you try to do with the roses. You make them grow fast and big. But how do you know these hormones will work on plants, Mr. Prentice? And how do you know how much to give them? And, and how big will the roses grow, Mr. Prentice? Questions. Everlasting questions. But now I ask them... Why did it go wrong? Thursday. Thursday? What do I remember? Well, I throw the hormone mixture that's left over, Mr. Prentice. Mr. Prentice, I said, well, I throw the hormones... Go away. You. Can't you see that I'm working? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. I remember. Friday. What a Friday. Friday night. <laughs> Yes. Is that you? Yes, Charles. What are you doing walking out here in the dark? It's a lovely night. Romantic at your age. I just like the night. You women, come back to the house. All right. Crazy walking around in the dark. <laughs> That's old. What's the matter with you? Can't you walk? If I hadn't caught you... It's slippery. What are you talking about? It's so slippery around here. Don't talk foolishness. But it is. By George, you're right. What? Stand still, I'll light a match. I had some... Yes. Now, we'll see what... Charles, stop grabbing. What? <laughs> Worm. What? Well, can't you see? Just ordinary earthworms. Night crawlers. We just walked over a few of them. Now, oh, you women with your fears and your squeamishness. Walk on a few worms and you make more noise and more fuzz. Yes, I remember. Friday night. The, the extra hormone solution, where will I throw it, Mr. Prentice? Mr. Prentice, where will I throw the extra hormone solution? Saturday. And then the night. Jackson! Jackson, where are you? Jackson, I told you to stay in the house. Jackson, where are you? Time to feed the plants. 
Jackson, where are you? He's not Claire. here, Charles. Uh, Claire, you startled me walking up like that. I didn't mean to. That infernal boy, where is he? Have you seen him? He's not in the house. But I told him not to go out. I told him only an hour ago he's got to work all night. The plants must be watered every hour on the hour. He went out. Well, why didn't you stop him? Now oh, I have to go chase after him. Jackson! Jackson, are you out there? Come in. Charles, what? Oh, well, what did you think it was? Thunder. It's starting to rain. Shut the door. Shut the door, I say. But the boy... If he hasn't the sense to come in out of the rain, it's just too bad. I've got enough to do with worrying about my roses without worrying about him. And don't you go out after him. He'll come back. He'll come back. Saturday night. And when it was day again... Charles, Charles, wake huh? up. Huh? Please wake up. Oh, where? You're on the couch. You fell asleep on the couch. Charles, huh? get up right away. Well, what's the matter with you? Why should I get up? What difference does it make? Listen to me, please. The boy, he isn't back yet. Huh? Jackson, he isn't back yet. Charles, where can he be? The storm, you slept, I waited. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Have you looked in his room? I just came from there. Charles, where could he have gone to? All through the oh, storm. stop talking so much and let me get up. Let's go see. Oh. Must you follow me? Why didn't you wake me up? Why did you let me sleep? I must have fallen asleep, too. I opened my eyes. It was day. Oh, Charles. Oh, stop old Charlesing me. Crazy young fool, so he spent the night outside. So what's the difference? Teach him a lesson. Well, no wonder he isn't back yet. Fog like this, it's as bad as night. Charles, I... All right, all right. What am I supposed to do? Go wandering through fog like a bloodhound, like a fool? Don't worry, he'll be back. He'll be back. But you never did come back, did you, Jackson? When the sun came out and that everlasting wind came up and lifted the fog. Charles, Charles, come here. Where? Uh, where are you? Back of the house, Charles. Come quickly. Oh, well, what is it? What do you want now? The boy isn't around. I've looked everywhere. Now, uh, what... what happened back here? What? Look at the ground. Well, what? Who plowed this ground up? Plowed? Yes, yeah, certainly plowed. Can't you see? Some crazy drunken fool plowed up the ground. But during the night? Charles, how could that be? You believe what you see, don't you? It's that boy. What? Yes, that Jackson went crazy, found a plow, tore up the ground and ran away. Went out of his mind, that's it. The boy's gone crazy, tearing up the ground. Gone crazy. Gone crazy. <laughs> And then, that night, that same night after I thought Jackson had gone crazy, run away, I went back to my work, Sunday night. Charles, Charles, can I speak to you? Charles, please stop your work and talk to me. Haven't you lived with me enough years to know I don't like to be interrupted when I'm working? But I'm frightened. Are you? Really? Charles, stop it. Are you out of your mind? Yes, maybe I am. What did you say? Maybe I am crazy. All right, maybe I am. That's the only way I could have lived with you all these years. What? Endured your selfishness, your unbelievable selfishness. Well... Everything's for you for 20 years, everything for you. Now, that's enough... Your work, your pleasures, what you think, what you want, everything for you, nothing for anyone else. Will you the shut up? The gentle little Mr. Prent is the scientist, the good husband who never lifts his voice. Mother in heaven, I'd rather be married to a fool with a heart in him than you. Well, I'm... You haven't got a heart. You never had a heart. It's you, you, and no one else, and that boy can be dead out there and you don't care, and I can be dead and you don't care as long as you're safe and doing what you want to do. Will you go away and let me go on with my work? <laughs> Charles, Charles, I'm fighting that boy. Now there are noises. I'm asking you for the last time to go away and let me do my work. But listen to me. You've been out here all night. But I've been in the back of the house alone, and I've been listening, and I didn't want to come in here, but I had to. Charles, things I said, I meant them. For years, I've meant them. All right, that doesn't matter. But I tell you this. There's something outside the house. Find out what it is, Charles. Twenty years ago, I thought you were an irrational woman. I thought I'd trained you out of that irrationality. I was wrong. I'll humor you just this once, but never again. Where are these noises? 
at the back of the house. The lantern handed to me? Yes. Thank you. You're frightened. You don't have to go with me. I want to know... What? That you're a fool? Well? So what am I supposed to hear? There's nothing. Hello out there. Hello. Well, what now? Listen. To what? Listen. To what? I... I thought... You heard the wind whistling through the cracks in your brain. Come into the house. Charles, wait. Wait for... Uh... Here? Yeah. So what? Give me the lantern. If it's that boy... Well, it could be him, couldn't that it? That crazy young fool playing practical jokes. If I get around the corner of the house and... <laughs> him up What's going on here? Charles. Something moving under the ground. Yes. Yeah. So dark. Can't quite make out... Charles, what is it? I don't know. I don't know. Animal of some sort? Take me back to the house. Oh, go yourself. Moon will come out of the clouds. See what this is. Give me the lantern, Charles. No, I want to see. The house is back there. Turn around and go back to it. Go ahead. All right. All right. Yes. It is something burrowing. Infernal moon come out, I'd see there. Coming out. Now I'll see what holes. Holes in the ground all over. What are they? Who Bomb craters? But that isn't possible. No. Animal burrows. But what animal could make a hole four feet across? What animal? Claire! Where are you? Claire! So dark, I can't see you. Claire! Where are you? Claire! Claire! Where are you? Claire! Yes, Claire. Claire! I ran through the night looking for you. The echo of my voice is still in my ears. Looking for you and the moon was under the clouds and I couldn't see you and I couldn't find you. And then I did. You had fallen into one of those craters. Into one of those holes in the ground. I couldn't see you, but I could hear you. But which one of the holes? They were all over ground, pockmarked with them. I ran around in the dark. I could hear you, but couldn't find you. And then the moon, it was out again. Oh, blast the moon. Why did it come out? If it hadn't come out, I wouldn't have seen. And my head... Stop it, stop it, stop it, Claire. Stop it. I can still hear you. I can still see you. Your body down in that hole. As I ran toward you, suddenly I saw that something else was coming toward you. Something that glistened wet in the moonlight. Something long and slimy. A great twisting snake. Yet not a snake. Not a snake. And the fear in me made me fall to the ground. And I saw as I lay there, I saw... The thing moved toward the hole in the ground as if you weren't there. As if it were blind and couldn't see. Like a great blind worm. It was a worm. A worm, ten, twenty, no, thirty feet long, crawling in fright to its home in the ground. And it moved toward you, Claire. Covered you. Crushed you. You're dead, Claire. You've been dead for two days. Why should I tear out of my memory all the horror of how you died? Of how young Jackson must have died? Where will I throw the extra hormone solution, Mr. Prentice? Where will I throw the extra hormone solution, Mr. Prentice? Yes. That's very funny, isn't it, Jackson? 
I ran away and I was going to bring back to the world the greatest rose. But I brought back the greatest worms. The hormones you threw away soaked into the ground and into them. Hundreds of little worms burrowing under the ground, soaking into their flesh, into their life process, miraculously increasing the growth of them until overnight they grew and grew without limit into those terrible horrors. And they are still growing. I can hear them. For the last two days, squirming around the house and over it, great monstrous pieces of slimy flesh squirming and writhing. Hundreds of them, thousands of them, burrowing under the ground and at night coming out of the ground. I have seen them, a sea of flesh, a sea of worms. Yes, I hear you out there, you worms. You were under the ground and now there's no room underground for you, so you come out of the ground. The world was yours first, so now you're going to take it back again. The world for the world. You're under the house. You're lifting it. The walls will fall and crush me, and I'll be dead, and I want to be dead. Yes, now I know why this is happening to me. I thought I could run away from the world and what is happening in the world. You hear that, you worms out there? I thought I could run away. Oh. Oh, I'm very tired. Just sit here and wait. Wait for them. I know how I'll die. The walls falling, crushing. Ooh. Window. Something behind me. A worm. At the window. Head looking in. He's crawling in. And another following. And another. They're filling the room. Worms. All around me. The worms. The worms. Around me. The worms covering me. Cold flesh. Wet flesh. The worms. The worms. Covering me. Revolt of the Worms from Lights Out, as originally heard October 13th, 1942. Coming up next, an episode from X-Minus One. 
In this classic episode titled Shanghai, originally aired January 9, 1955, sees a groom at his bachelor party, gets kidnapped and taken aboard a spaceship bound for a flight due to last 15 years. The script used for this episode was previously used in another sci-fi series, Dimension X, five years earlier in 1950. And after making an appearance in this episode, Ross Martin, you may remember, played in the television western Wild Wild West opposite Robert Conrad. So, from January 9th, 1955, this is X-1 with Shanghai. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. X, 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 minus, 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 one, one, one. one. Tonight's story, Shanghai. <laughs> okay, okay, very funny, very funny Take it over, boy, tomorrow the old ball and chain yeah. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you commit matrimony <laughs> now, Come on, now, look, oh, come on, we came down here to Scully Square to have a little fun We might as well be at my mother's music hall in Beacon Street Oh, the problems of the rich uh, Tell me, Jeff, just where does the coffin fortune come from? Pirate treasure? No, no, I guess it started in Nantucket, my great, great Something or other used to be a whaler. A whaler, there she blows. A dead whale or a stove boat. Watch my trusty harpoon. <laughs> hey, 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 we'll look out for the port. Oh, my. And where's the money now? Oh, I don't know. We've got a lot of commercial holdings, mills, import, export outfits, rocket lines, you know. Mere trivia. <laughs> All right, now look, why don't we get out of this dump? We go up to the Copley Plaza. It may be stuffy, but at least the glasses are clean. Well, you're the condemned man. All right, you two go ahead and get in the car. I'll settle. All right, meet you out in front. Right. Uh, excuse me. Uh, you want something, bud? Yeah, the check. Okay, okay. Hey, Milton, check. He'll be right out. Right, thank you. Hello, mate. Nice night, eh? Hmm? Oh, yeah, I suppose so. I've been watching you. Celebrating? Sort of. Yes, so am I. Just got off a deep space run out to Centaurus. Oh, that's a 15-year run, isn't it? Fifteen and three blooming months. Mm -hmm. well, how'd you know? You a spaceman? No, no, not exactly. Uh, where's that check, barkeep? Hang on to your hat, bud. Milton's slow, but he's sure. Uh, fill it up, Charlie. Oh, Say, why don't you join me, Mikey? Here, Charlie. Oh, oh no, uh, no, no, thank you. Oh, come on, won't take off him, oh. Well, celebrate whatever it is you're celebrating on me. Pour it, Charlie. Oh, shit. Well, all right, thank you. I guess I might as well. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah, right, cheers. <coughs> oh, what was that, Marty? <laughs> Charlie's special <laughs> friend, eh, Charlie? Yeah. Well, oh, say, look, Charlie, would you get that uh, waiter out here? I've got to meet him. I, uh... Hey, what's your hurry, matey? you got plenty of time. Well, sure. Well... Sit down. Take huh? a daisy. You don't look so good. No, no, I, I don't feel uh, so good. Uh, yeah, now, sit right here. You feel chipper as a blooming grasshopper in a well, sec. Uh, no, I, I've got to get outside. The car's in a hurry. I'm... Where, where, where's the check? The check? The... Oh. oh. On your feet, wakey, wakey, wakey. Uh, oh, oh, right, let go of me. What's the idea? Uh, rise and shine and greet the dawn. What? Where am I? 
What's going on here? Now, come on now, Maisie. Up in there. Wakey, wakey, wakey. Wait, no, wait a minute. So you were at that bar, Scully Square. Come on now. Up on deck or you'll be in trouble. Deck? What are you talking about? Where am I? It's hard to say exactly. Off end, about eight hours out of Atlantic Spaceport. Atlantic Spaceport? Now, look, what kind of a joke is this? If, if Alan and Peter think this is funny... What what uh, what ship is this? R.S. Michael M. Rafferty, coffin line. Oh, coffin line. Well, that makes it easy. Now, you've got to put back to port. Hey, forget your toothbrush, Bank. No, 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 listen to you. Run, you take me hey, to the captain or I'll tell you Hey, hey, I'll let go of my jacket. All right, get moving. Yeah. Sure, sure, my dear. I'll take you to the captain, but you're going to be sorry. Morton, what the devil are you doing on the bridge? Get below before right away, I... sir. Only this here gentleman asked to see you. Yeah, that's right, uh, Captain. There's been a mistake made. I'm afraid it was supposed to be a joke. Oh? Yes, you see, I'm going to be married today, and I suppose the boys thought it'd be funny to make me miss the ceremony. I'm sure it won't be too much trouble to have you drop me off back at the Atlantic Spaceport. What? Morton, what is this? Well, it's simple, Captain. He wants you to turn the ship around, that's all. Now, look, if there's any uh, trouble with your superior, I'm sure I can fix it up. You see, I'm Jeff Coffin. Yeah? Well, you don't understand. My father is Cyrus Coffin. He owns this ship. Oh, he does, huh? Morton, get this drunk now, along. Now, just a minute. I can understand you're not believing me, but I can identify my... Hey, where's my wallet? I've been robbed. Oh, well, now, look, Captain. Wait a minute. All you have to do is radio back and check. Mr. Black, remove this man from the bridge. Yes, but... I sir. You're the Captain Buster. Oh, no, wait a minute. Let go of me. This is no way to treat a passenger. Passenger? Huh. Wake up, sonny boy. You're one of the crew. Now get below. All right now, Mike. Grab yourself a buffer. Get to work on this deck, no, They can't get away with this. This is kidnapping. Perhaps yes, perhaps no. Now get this here deck nice and shiny. We might even see about some crap. I'll be back in two hours. And mind you, I want to be able to see me blooming reflection in it. Better polish that deck plate. You can't get away with this. Well, the law says once you sign on, you're under absolute orders. I looked it up. Yeah, but I didn't sign on. I was kidnapped. You won't be able to prove it. Come on, mister, please. I didn't get anything to eat yet today, so give me a break, huh? Oh, all right. What do you do, run the buffer over it? Yeah, that's right. Like this. You sign on? Yeah, I ran away from home. How old are you? Sixteen. Thirty when we get back. Yeah. What do you mean, thirty? We're headed for Mars, aren't we? Only to refuel. We're outbound to Centaurus. Oh, no, it can't be. <laughs> well, that's a fifteen-year run. Morton! I've got to get back. No use. I'm getting married. My bride-to-be will think I'm dead. Martin! What? Uh, what's up here? Uh, you want me to call Mr. Black again? He'll give you what listen, for. Listen to me, Morton. Listen, I've got to get back to Earth. I can't disappear for 15 years. Oh, is that the fact? Look, we stop at Mars, right? Yes, and you'll be below decks under lock and key. Listen to me. If I can make it worth your while, will you get me off at Marsport? <laughs> Jump and ship, huh? That's real naughty, mate. One thousand dollars? Why, what would I tell me poor old mother in yeah. better say? Two thousand. Five. In advance. What do you mean, in advance? You're probably the one that rolled me for my wallet. I'll find a way. They don't believe your young coffin, but uh, maybe I know better. All right, it's a deal. Look, Mr. Coffin, can you take me with you? I didn't realize what it would be like. I, I can pay my share. I, I I could work it out for you, or maybe borrow money. I, I, I couldn't stand 15 years. I'd go crazy. All right, all right, sure. What about it, Morton? Boy, will cost you another thousand. You cheap well, swim. Here now, Mr. Coffin. I'm all what stands between you and a lovely pleasure cruise for 15 years. So I'll thank you to treat me with a respect and politeness what a gentleman like myself deserves. All right, now. Listen careful. This is the cable locker for the grappling anchor. Right. 
When she lands this hatch will open, cables go out. Don't get yourself caught in them. You'll be tore apart. All right, we've got that. Are you sure we can get out? Now, you just do what I say. When we drop down to the blast pit, nobody will be there. I low in the pit till dark. Got that? Right. Now, look, Morton, I'll tell the patrol you helped us get away. That'll help you when they catch up with this game. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you kindly. I've got to get to my station now. Luck. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Morton. the landing horn. Now, keep clear of that cable, Joey. Here we go. Right. Hold on tight. There goes the grappling cable. Yeah. All right, come on. Drop through the hatch. It's about six feet. Yeah. All right, it's clear. Hurry up. Here I come. Oh. You all right? Yeah, I twisted my ankle. It's all right. All right, that's the blast pit. Get going. All right. All right, so far, the ship hides us. Here's the pit. All right, now get down so they can't see you. Wait a minute. I hear somebody coming. Keep still. Maybe we better look. Look, if we stick our heads up over the edge, they'll see us short. Now keep down and keep still. I hear them. Well, well, well. Look what we have here. Two little babes in the wood. Now, you two move, and I'll shoot you in the belly. Morton, you got good eyes. I told you, so I'm coming this way, Mr. Black. Jumping ship. My, that's a terrible thing to do. Mr. Black... Inform the ship's company that these two men have been found guilty of attempted desertion. Desertion? You kidnapped me, you dirty crook. Don't you talk yeah. to Captain Howell that way. I'm sentencing them to 24 hours hull watch. Take them away. Morton, take them to the aft lock. I said. You calm down after 24 hours hull watch. What's hull watch? Very simple. We put you two in space suits, shove you through the airlock on the end of a line. You sit out there and watch the earl for 24 hours. No food, no water, and the eating units in those suits are just a little bit defective. Makes it interesting along about the 18th hour. Yeah, I'll bet. Here we are, gentlemen. The airlock. You get in there. Got five minutes to get into them suits before we blow the air out. See you in 24 hours. Maybe. should control these animal yeah. instincts. Get water. Right, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Sloppy like a bloody head. Joy. Joy passed out. Help him. He'll be all right. Teach your lesson, both of you. Take my advice and behave yourself. You've got 15 years to go on this here ship. You might as well make the best of it. Call this man. Let your supper, mighty food concentrate. What's the idea? Only two months out and on concentrates already? You complaining, right? Yeah, I'm complaining. If Captain Howell's chiseling on the manifest, that's his business. But when he tries to take it out now, how? You keep quiet or I'll turn you into Mr. Black. Concentrate is what you get to eat from here on out. Now shove it into your face and keep quiet. Suppose I shove it into your face it's... and see how you like it. What's going on in here? What's going on? He Morton. struck me. He struck me, Arch. What? 48 hours, how watch? Oh, no, no, no. All right, what are you all looking at? Get back into your places. Morton, bring that man down to the aft airlock. It's 
Murder. That's what. Plain murder. Base code gives a 30-hour limit for punishment. They didn't even have a burial. Just shoved them out the lock. Well, if the owners knew about this, they'd stop it. Uh, fat lot of good that's going to do us during the next 15 years. Yes, better. Wait a minute. If we could get the ship back to Mars. No, two weeks after we landed, we'd be hung. That's what space code says about mutiny. And if they catch you in the act, they shoot you down and no question. All right, I'm willing to take that chance. We're going to let Black and Howell kick us around for 15 years. Why don't we take over and head back? Right. I'm for right. it. Let's go. You bet. Yeah. Going to wrap something, gentlemen. Discussion. Talking about the captain might be... Grab him. Get 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 him. Oh, your life, Brown, and that's what I like. Yeah, show him my oil rag, Morton. Well, that's done it. He's an officer. Who cares? Yeah, we've got to move now. Joey? Yeah? You get up to the radio room and smash the set before they can get a message out. Right. Pop, you get aft. Tell the engine watch. Yes. The rest of us will go up on the bridge. How about this rat? Tie him up. Speed counts now. We've got to take over before they know what hit him. We've got to surprise him. Don't worry, we'll get him cool. Yeah, shh, quiet. Fox was sending when I got in, but I knocked him out and smashed the set. We're okay. Good boy. All right, come on. Right past the bulkhead. Look out! <laughs> the blast bulkhead. Yeah, we're cut off from the bridge. We'll never get through that. Yeah, they must have found out somehow. The intercom. Black can turn it on from the bridge. You heard the whole thing. Well, we better get out of here. What'll they do? I don't know. We've got all the controls up there. We can shut down the driver, but we can't steer. Yeah. You better dog down the hatch behind us. All right, men. Captain Howell's giving you one minute to give up quiet. In a pig's eye, Black. You'll hang for mutiny, every one of you. What do we do now? Quiet. They can hear everything on the intercom. Not if I pull the jack out. That's your boy. Yeah. Look, we've got to get through to the bridge. The Mexican standoff. We can't get at them. They can't get at us. What's that? It's an air leak. The pressure's down. It's Howell. He blew the hatch on the mess hall section. Just opened her up and let the air out. Morton, do you know what Black's going to do? He's going to bleed off the air down here. Save you all right. If I had my way, I'd see you all out on the hull till you froze still. You're forgetting something, Morton. You're back here with us. What do you mean? If Black and Howell blow out compartments one by one or bleed the air off, you'll get it, too. <laughs> They'll take care of me. Don't you worry about that. Oh, you think so, huh? Joey? Yeah. Plug that intercom back in. Right. Captain? Captain? Hear me up? We've got Morton back here. Yeah? If you try anything on us, he'll get it, too. What am I supposed to do, cry? You don't care if he dies? That's his problem. We're going to drop the oxygen level 5%. Don't do that to me. Captain! Captain! It's unfortunate that you were captured, Morton, but the security of my ship comes first. You mean you don't care? You'll see me dead. Precisely. Well, you can't. It's murder, that's what. I'm not one of them. You can't kill me. You can't. Joey, pull the intercom plug. All right, there you are, Morton. They'd kill you just as soon as look at you. Now, listen, we've got to get through that bulkhead. You know this ship. There must be some way. Morton, we're your only chance. Get us through the bulkhead. All right. All right. Why shouldn't I? They killed me. Well, then there is a way to get through. An emergency release. Uh-huh. So don't tell crewmen about it to keep them from breaking through in an engine blast and leaking radiation to the bridge. Well, then let's get going. We've got to get through that bulkhead before Howell cuts the air down and gets us all. <laughs> Here's the bulkhead, Morgan. Where's the release? Under the floor panel. You can pry it up. All right, hurry. I got it, I got it. Yeah, she's up. Works on a key. Ready? All right, Morton. Open it up. Here goes. Well, uh, a boy. Morton. Morton. He's dead. <sighs> Electrocuted and the bulkhead's still closed. Didn't even get to turn that key. It killed him instantly. Harry. Yeah. Have you got your watch gloves? They're insulated. Oh, you're sure. You get Morton out of the oh, way. Don't touch him, Joey. 
He's got the current through it. I'll shove him away with the gloves. All right, now. Stand by. Here goes the key. All right, let's go. Get him. Come on, in. Right, Stand back there. Come on, get him. Flexi, how you like this? Uh, Grab the gun. Uh, Joey, look out. Uh, Let go of that gun, Hal. Uh, All right, hold them both. You don't have to worry about Black. I got him square with a wrench. We better tie up the captain. Yeah. Well, what do you think you're going to do now? We're going to turn around and go back home. Uh-huh. I don't think so. I burned the navigation tapes, and none of you can recalculate them. Why, you You dirty. just wander in space till the fuel gives out. You'll die right here on this ship. Went on. Meteor? No, no, it's a ship. A patrol ship coming up on us. Oh, they must have got an SOS off. Yeah, well, I'm not so sure that's the <laughs> well, Wait a minute, we don't have to worry. We can just tell them the truth. <laughs> You're not familiar with space code, young man. Mutiny is punishable by immediate execution. In other words, they don't ask questions. They just shoot. He's right, Jeff. We're through. Can we get away? Not from a patrol ship. Already sent us a heap to flash. If we run, they'll blow us out of space. I'm afraid your mutiny is about over with, gentlemen. They'll be aboard in an hour. And ten minutes after that, you'll all be dead. Nobody move. Sergeant, take a squad and secure the ship. Collect all weapons and post a guard in the engine room. Yes, sir. You, Ralph, William, Osirsky, come on. Well, I'm delighted to see you, Major. I wasn't quite sure my SOS had gotten through. Oh? You're Captain Howell? That's right. And I can swear out the affidavit of mutiny. I don't think a mutiny charge will stand up, Howell. Not with the relief of command warrant out for you. I think we'll just forget about it. But you can't do that. Space code is clear. You recorded my SOS. No, we didn't, Howell. Then how'd you get here? They sent us after you to get Jeff Coffin. Where is he? I'm Jeff Coffin. Jeff, we had a missing persons alarm for you, and then when a check you signed turned up at Mars for it. A check? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's right. I gave one to Morton to help me get away. And he sold it to a fence for half face value. We traced it back to the ship. Coffin, I've got orders to escort you personally. We're taking you back to Earth. Uh, can I send out a message, Major? Of course. Oh, well, that reminds me, Jeff. I've got one for you from your fiance. She said to tell you that she didn't object to a bachelor party in principle, but she did think six months was stretching it a bit. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you Shanghai, written by Ernest Kenoy. Featured in the cast were Lyle Sudrow as Jeff Coffin, Louis Van Rooten as Martin, Jack Hartley as Captain Howell, Jack Grimes as Joey, Jim Dukas as Black, Ross Martin as Harry, Robert Dryden as Pop, Sid Raymond as the barkeep, and Ivor Francis as the space officer. Your announcer, Bill Rippey. Well, folks, that wraps up our very first edition of our classic Radio Rewind podcast. Please click subscribe so you can get notified of new classic Radio Rewind episodes as they are released weekly. For more classic old-time radio entertainment, visit www.wotrradionetwork.com where you can listen to any of the four old-time radio stations. Old Time Radio USA is our variety station playing everything from adventures to western, from comedy to sci-fi. Suspense Radio USA plays all the known available episodes from the Suspense Radio series that ran from 1942 to 1962. 
featuring over 900 episodes. Crime Time Radio USA brings you all of the favorite detective and crime dramas. And Radio Mystery Theater USA broadcasts your favorite episodes from the CBS Radio Mystery Theater featuring E.G. Marshall and Tammy Grimes. All stations are available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and are completely free to listen to. Take our stations on the go with you with the WOTR Radio Network mobile app. This can be downloaded from the Google Play Store, the Apple App Store, and the Amazon App Store. So, for Classic Radio Rewind and the WOTR Radio Network, this is Barry Slinker saying goodbye for now.